Well, good morning, Crossing Community Church. Glad you made it here today. Uh, so thankful that you're here and uh, thankful for the praise band leading us again in worship this morning. And um, I guess I should just go ahead and get this out of the way. I know I look a little bit different. The beard is gone. And so I just have to tell you that this past week we had a vacation Bible school here at a local church and uh, I, I got to play Mario. So, yeah, it's a, yeah. Stop it! Stop laughing, Eli. I know you're laughing at me. No, I'm just messing. Um, yeah, so you know, you do what you got to do for the kids, right? You know, um, man, I, I love I love kids. I love uh, teaching them the gospel, and it was a great VBS, and we had a great time. And so, but I'm looking forward to being back with you, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday. And uh, we're going to start a new series, um, and uh, it's going to be about parables in the Bible, uh, stories that Jesus told to, to teach us a point. But today, we're going to wrap up our last encounter with Jesus, and we're going to see somebody that Jesus met right near the end of his life, uh, where, right before he was crucified. And uh, you guys might know that name, Pilate. Um, if you don't know Pilate... He was a high-ranking leader uh, over all these other soldiers. And uh, so we're going to turn to John chapter 18. Uh, we've seen a lot of encounters with Jesus the last few weeks. Um, we've seen Jairus' daughter. Uh, Jesus healed her. And on the way to that, he healed a woman that had uh, a, a disease that was plaguing her. And then uh, we, we saw him cast out demons a bunch of demons into the pigs. We saw him cast out a demon from a boy. And uh, the father said, Lord, help my unbelief. I don't know if that's you today or I I'm telling you every day, I'm like, Lord, help my unbelief, right? Help me to have more faith. Um, and uh, and then he met a, a, a Pharisee, this, this self-righteous religious man. And in the same dinner right there, a, a woman from the town who was just so unrighteous, full of sin, came and washed Jesus' feet with her tears. And, and we saw a, a comparison to the self-righteous person and an unrighteous person, and that they both need Jesus. And so you might know some self-righteous people, people too proud to need Jesus. And then you might see some people that are so unrighteous that out of their sin, they need Jesus. I don't know how you came to know Jesus. Maybe it was out of unrighteousness, a life full of sin, and you, you repented. You said, Lord, I need your forgiveness. Or maybe you were a self-righteous person. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. I, I'm, I'm okay. I do enough good works. Well, you still need Jesus. You, you can't forgive your own sin. God needs to be the forgiver of your sin. You need to ask him to save you from that sin. And you need to repent and turn and be baptized. That's what the Bible teaches us. And so I don't know if that's you today, but uh, we saw Jesus encounter that. And then last week we saw Jesus heal a blind man halfway. We saw him touch his eyes and, and he could see people walking around like trees, he said. And then Jesus touched him again and healed him all the way. And I thought, why? Why would he do that? Well, guess what? On this, on this earth, we won't see everything clearly. We have to walk by faith. We have to trust Jesus and what he says, the Bible and what it says, by faith, by faith. And then one day, when our faith is made sight in heaven, it, then, then we can see clearly. God will show us clearly everything. And I'm excited about that day, but it's not automatic. Uh, a lot of people around the world think we can just die and go to heaven automatically, but that's not the case. You have not repented and you've not asked Jesus to forgive you of that sin. You'll have to pay for that sin in a place called hell. That's what the Bible teaches. And so the good news is Jesus does provide that salvation, but will you trust that? Our central idea for today, we must surrender and submit to the one who has the ultimate authority. Do you have people in your life that are the authority over you. Uh, the soldiers knew what authority meant back then. Pilate, he was a governor over this area. He was, he was in charge. He was leader of, of these people. And so he had centurions, uh, these Roman soldiers, under his command. So, so Pilate knew what it was to have authority. Well, let's look and see 
when Jesus gets brought in to Pilate's court. So, so he had had the last supper with his disciples. He went out into the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed and then he was arrested. He was then illegally through the night questioned by the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the, the high, high court of the church. And that was all illegal. You weren't allowed to do that. You had to call everybody. The Sanhedrin is another name for that group that questioned Jesus throughout the night. And then after that, they Jesus did tell them that he was the son of God. And, and so they, they were so torn up. They took him to Pilate because Pilate was the only one that had authority to execute people, to kill people. And these Jews wanted Jesus killed because they didn't realize he truly was the Messiah. He truly was the Son of God. So as Jesus is brought before Pilate, let's see what happens. In John chapter 18, verse 28, let's read this. John 18, verse 28. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. The Jews did not want to be made unclean. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal, so they did not enter the palace. You have to realize back then, the Jews and the Gentiles, the, the non-Jews, they did not mix. The Jews felt if you went even into their place or their home, you would be made unclean. I mean, we obviously don't, that's not the way it is today. Right, And Jesus had some things to say about that, even throughout the New Testament we see. So verse 29, Pilate came out to them. He asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? He has committed crimes, they replied. If he hadn't, we would not have handed him over to you. Well, Pilate said, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. But we don't have the right to put anyone to death. The Jews complained. And, and so I'm sure at that point, Pilate said, you want to kill this man? Well, he must have done some really bad things. And, uh, and the Jews told him, he was like, we can't put anyone to death. Well, verse 32, this happened so that the words Jesus had spoken about how he was going to die would come true. See, this was all part of God's plan was for Jesus to die on a cross to save us from our sin. And so verse 33, then Pilate went back inside the palace. He ordered Jesus to be brought to him. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Verse 35, am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What have you done? He, he's trying to get to the bottom of like, what, what is it that you've done that's so bad? Verse 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not part of this world. If it were, those who serve me would fight. They would try to keep the Jews from arresting me. My kingdom is from another place. Oh, verse 37, he says, so you are a king then. See, this, this intrigued a uh, pilot. This, this got his attention when Jesus said he was a king because the Roman, the Roman rule, Caesar, was in, in, in ultimate control. And if there's another king that's trying to get control, Pilate has to make sure that doesn't happen. So when his ears got, uh, oh, wait a minute, you're a king. And, and so verse 37, so you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right to say I am a king. In fact, that's the reason I was born. I came into the world to give witness to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. So, do you understand? Jesus said that. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I'm just giving witness of the truth. So if Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is just clearly showing who God is. And, and we know that what the Bible says, Jesus is God. And so all Jesus is telling is the truth, and he's showing who God is, which is truth. In him, there's no lies. And then verse 38, it's really interesting. 
says, what is truth? Pilate asked. So I want to stop there for just a second. What is truth? Uh, it, a lot of people are asking that question nowadays. They don't know what to believe. They don't know who to believe. They don't know what their purpose is in life. It's what, why am I here? What is, what is true? What can I rely on? What can I have a basis for my life on? And, and maybe the question is not what is truth. Maybe the question should be who is truth? Who is it that you can really trust with your life? You probably have some good friends, maybe some family members that you would trust with your very life. But the ultimate one who will never let you down. Guess what? Humans, we make mistakes, don't we? All of us could raise our hands say we made mistakes. We've sinned. We've done wrong things. And we've even let people down. And, and we can't be fully trusted. I mean, that's what's obviously true. We can't. But the one we can trust who can never let us down ultimately is the ultimate authority. And that's Jesus. Jesus is God's son. We can trust. We can. He's truth. And so he asked, what is truth? Pilate asked. Then Pilate went out again to the Jews. He said, I find no basis for any charge against him. And, and he's trying to understand, why are you all so mad at him? He hasn't done anything. He just said he's a king. So what? And, and Pilate could see, he, this isn't the type of king that's a conquering hero. Uh, you know, Pilate didn't feel threatened by Jesus militarily. And so why, he's asking this crowd, why? Why? Verse 39. So Pilate comes up with an idea. It's, it's your practice for me to set one prisoner free for you at the Passover time. Remember, this was the Passover time. Jesus had just celebrated the Passover on that Thursday night, and he was arrested and, and killed on Friday morning. Pilate says, do you want me to set the king of the Jews free? But they all shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had actually taken part in an armed struggle against the country's rulers. So he, he actually led this rebellion against the Romans, and he actually had committed murder. We see that in the other Gospels. They actually record that Barabbas had committed murder. So these Jews are asking for a murderer back instead of Jesus. And Pilate is probably just going, what in the world are you guys wanting? Do you guys realize this murder is going to murder more of your people. And Jesus doesn't seem like a criminal. And so Pilate at this point had to be thinking, all right, so Jesus, here he's either a crazy man or you really are a king. But, but the fact that he's a criminal, that's not on Pilate's mind. He doesn't look at this guy as a criminal. And so he's trying to get these people to take him back, set him free. And, and so now there's just total confusion. Pilate doesn't know what to do. He's like, I'm confused. I, I'm going to try to give this, this man back to these people. These people are just screaming for him to, to, to just be killed, basically. So Pilate comes up with a solution, right? Let's not kill him. We'll whip him. Okay. And then maybe that'll settle you people down. So then we look at John 19. Look at John 19, verse 1. Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers twisted thorns together to make a crown. They put it on Jesus' head. Then they put a purple robe on him. They went up to him again and again. They kept saying, we honor you, king of the Jews. So what are they doing? They're just mocking him. And they hit him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out. He said to the Jews, look, I am bringing Jesus out to you. I want to let you know that I found no basis for a charge against him. So in other words, Pilate thought, well, if I whip him, that's what the crowd will want. And so that, that'll be it. Don't want him back now. And he says, I find no basis for a charge against him. Verse five, Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Then Pilate said to them, here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. But Pilate answered, 
You take him and crucify him. I myself find no basis for a charge against him. Then the Jews replied, we have a law. That law says he must die. He claimed to be the son of God. And when Pilate heard that, he was even more afraid. So now Pilate's, he's kind of scared. He's like, this, this guy's claiming to be the son of God? Well, maybe now he is a crazy man. Is he a crazy man or a king? Now Pilate, he can't figure things out. He's more confused. And he went back inside the palace. And so he decides to talk to Jesus privately. It's like, we got to talk some more. We, 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 I got to find out some answers. So he brings Jesus back. They went back inside the palace, verse 9. And he said, where do you come from? In other words, he's trying to find out what nation, what king are you of, what country? He asked Jesus, where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer him. Now, if you're a man, a governor, uh, in authority, and you ask somebody a question, you respectfully answer. And Jesus did not answer him. So how do you think this is going for Pilate as a, a man of pride and arrogance and authority? And you don't answer me? Oh, he's probably getting upset, probably getting angry inside. He was, he was still seeking though. Pilate, I like this about Pilate. He was still wanting answers. He was curious. You know what? So many people nowadays, they're not even curious about God. They just want to live their lives and they want to do what they want to do. And they're not seeking to even find answers about the truth, about what happens when we die. Why are we here? What's our purpose in life? People aren't even seeking that anymore. They're just being blinded by the things of this world and that that will satisfy them. You know these people, right? Maybe that's you here today. You're just being satisfied by the things this world has to offer. I hope, I hope we look past that and that we seek to find the things in our lives that are idols in our lives and, and say, no, Lord, you are most important. You are the most important thing in my life. Pilate was seeking. He was trying to find truth and he didn't, he didn't even get a word back. And so what does Pilate do? Watch what Pilate says. He says this in verse 10, do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you understand? I have the power to set you free or to nail you to a cross. I mean, Pilate just laid it out there. He's like, you don't understand the power that I have. But Jesus, oh, Jesus knew how. He knew how to humble someone. He looked and he answered this in verse 11. Jesus answered, you were given power from heaven. If you weren't, you would have no power over me. Boom. Wow. I mean, you talk about, that's a, that's a, a, you know, a mic drop moment. Boom. Right. At that point, Pilate was like, whoa. Okay. I have. So, so Jesus goes on to say the one actually who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And that's meaning Judas, right? Judas. In verse 12, look look at Pilate's response. I love this. After this, he said, it says, verse 12, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is against Caesar. Now, at that point, Pilate's hands were tied because he his loyalty lies to Caesar. And if this is a king, he has to go with Caesar. And so we see eventually what happened, right? Pilate, he actually handed over Jesus to be crucified. And, and in Matthew's account of this story, Matthew wrote about this as well. Matthew adds in that Pilate 
washed his hands of this whole thing, saying, it's not on me, it's on you and your heads that, that this is going to be done. And so Pilate was an interesting, interesting man. And, and I think we can learn a lot from this. I want you to imagine that tomorrow you're going to be joining the military. I mean, I know that's a big, big imagination thing, right? You know, but you are entering into the military. And when you get to the military, are you in charge anymore? Absolutely not. Your power is gone. And your power rests in the hands of the ones above you. And those people that are in power over you, they actually have had power from the people over them. And so on and so on until the very highest commander. And so I want us to think in terms of this. A lot of times we don't think in terms of God being our commander. And, and like the, the central idea today, the central idea is we must surrender and submit to the one who has the ultimate authority. And, and Jesus laid it out there saying, the only authority you have, Pilate, is what was given to you from above. In other words, God is in control. God has the ultimate authority. And I think sometimes we take that for granted. And as, as you would serve in the military, you know, say again, you join tomorrow, you're going to have commanders over you that you, you like. And then there's some commanders over you that you wouldn't like. And you know what that does to us? That puts into our mind something like this. Well, this commander, I, I, I want to do what he says because I, I like him. I respect him. I have a healthy fear of him. Or maybe this other man over here, I don't like him very much. So I have to do what he says. You ever thought about that? The things you do in life, there's some things you want to do. Then there's other things you have to do. And some of that is based on who's in authority over you. And, and so with Jesus, we ought to have what's called a healthy fear of God. And you say, Tim, well, I thought all fears were bad. Well, no, there's healthy fears. Uh, I think about uh, what if there was a, a you know, I, I went down by a river and there was a crocodile. Well, I have a healthy fear of a crocodile. Why is that? Because I know that crocodile can overpower me and eat me, <laughs> right? Even the smallest one, I, I, I would have a healthy fear of because I know who would be in control in that situation. And so there's a healthy fear. Our healthy fear of God, though, is not to be scared of God. It would be to be scared without him. See, when we're scared of God, that means we have something to hide. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. When they first sinned, they, they ran, they hid. They realized they were naked, they did wrong, and they hid. They were scared of God because they knew there was consequence. They knew what God had promised. And so to fear God is, is like having a respect, a reverence for God. I heard this this past week. It was really amazing. It said, do not become so familiar with God that you lose your fear of God. Now, I want, I want to be clear about this. Of course, we're supposed to, to study the scripture and learn more about God and become familiar with God. But when we come, become so familiar with God that we lose our fear of God, well, then we're just looking at Jesus as my friend. Oh, Jesus, he, he's a good friend. I high five him. He's, he's my friend. I love, he can give so much to me. I, I can be blessed by him. Oh, he's, he's, he's this and this for me. But maybe we're actually asking him for this and this and this, and we're not asking God 
what do you want from me? You know, God calls us to be under his authority. And what God tells us in the Bible is true. And we need to have a healthy fear of God. Let's love God, but fear him. Let's worship God, but fear him. Let's learn more about God, but fear him. Let's serve him, but fear God. I heard the story of a, a man who went and interviewed a pastor. The problem was this pastor, he was a, a well-known pastor back in like the 1980s. He was on TV. He made so much money, but he was committing crimes and having some a terrible sin in his life while he was doing all this. And finally, he got caught and he wound up in jail. And this man went to interview this pastor while he was in jail. And he looked at the pastor and he said, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? And the pastor replied, I, I never fell out of love with Jesus. And the, the man interviewing him said, no, you, you didn't understand my question. You were doing all these terrible things. When did you fall out of love with Jesus? And he said, I never fell out of love with Jesus. He said, I, I, I love Jesus, but I didn't fear God. And oh, is that us? Oh, is that us sometimes? I can love Jesus. Oh yeah, Jesus is great. He's my friend. Oh yeah. But when God tells us to not do this or not do that or do this and we don't, are we fearing God? And I have to ask that to myself. I, I came across a verse. This is amazing. Proverbs 16, 6. It says this, through love and truth, sin is paid for. Now, who, who was love and truth? That was Jesus. That was God himself wrapped in a human body. That is Jesus. Jesus is love and truth. And it says, Proverbs 16, 6. I love this. It says, through love and truth, sin is paid for. People avoid evil when they have respect for the Lord. That, uh, that word respect also is translated fear. People avoid evil when they fear the Lord. Where are you at today? Do you fear the Lord? Do you change your life because you want to? Or does it feel like, oh, I have to give this up. Or I have to do this because God tells me to. I hope it's not that. I hope it's this, this thought of Jesus paid everything on a cross to die for that sin. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. And I want to turn from evil because of all you've done for me. Let's learn to love what he loves and hate what he hates. Let's learn to hate sin the way God hates sin. And I'm not talking about hating people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying hate people. I'm saying hate sin. And, and if somebody is sinning and you know them in your life, you don't hate that person. You hate that sin that they're struggling with. And you pray, God, would you free them from the curse of that sin? Would you set them free? Would they come to know you? God, would you save them? That should be the church's heart. And if people saw the church how they should be, not judgmental, but actually praying for people to be set free from curses of sin, maybe that's you here today. Maybe, you know, there's, there's things I struggle with. And these are sins that God wants us to put away. And through his power, he can help us do that. I, I heard about uh, this man and woman who were living kind of deeper in the jungle. 
and and there was a road that had electricity going you know that, that had the lines and everything going down the road but they never had electricity run back to their home back in this jungle and and so one day the the power company hooked them up and and got the lines down to their house and and they had electricity well somebody at the electric company actually saw their bill and 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 saw that they had only used like one unit of electricity in three months and and so somebody went back to visit them and said is your power not working and they said oh yeah no it's working we we turned the light on long enough to light our candles <laughs> and so here they are they had the power of electricity but they're living in the old way that they were used to when we become believers in christ there's a new way that God wants us to live. That's what I'm saying. Love God, but fear him. Let's worship God, but fear him. Let's serve him, but fear him. Learn more about him, but fear him. And sometimes I think, you know, I could go, I mean, maybe all of us, we could go out into the community and say, hey, do you love Jesus? And everybody would say, oh yeah, I love Jesus. Yeah, he's great. But if you ask them a follow-up question, you say, do you fear God? They'd look at you kind of strange and go, oh, why do I need to fear God? Fear God? You know, maybe maybe someone would say, oh, yeah, sure. You know, just to appease what you're trying to say or just kind of get you to stop asking these questions, maybe. Or some of them would kind of be curious, like, why do I have to fear God? Oh, fear God. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is to know the ways of right and wrong. And God can give us that wisdom to know how to live. He has the power. The Holy Spirit, the, the Bible promises the Holy Spirit. When we become Christians, we can have the Holy Spirit, and that is power to live life in freedom, not under the curse of sin. And so I'm, I'm praying that if you're here today and you're, you're feeling that bondage, under a curse of sin that God could free you and in his power would set you free. It begins with a fear of God, a healthy fear. Again, not being scared of God. If you're scared of God, you have something to hide. But if you have a fear, you have this respect and this love for him and you'll do anything for him because you want to, not because you have to. And so, Will you remember the central idea of surrendering and submitting to the one who has the ultimate authority? As we, as we end this today, what I would hope is that if you would, just go ahead and, and bow your heads, close your eyes. And I just want to read some scripture that will help us to humble ourselves and say, I, I need to release all this power that I think I have all this pride that I have in my life. And I need to get back to remember God is God. And I have not been treating him like he is God. I, I've been I've been just high-fiving Jesus and, oh, we've been living life and, and living life the way I want and still sinning and not putting away things in my life that need to be put away. And I need to have this healthy fear of God. So if you would, again, close your eyes, bow your heads. I want you to just hear these verses it's a reminder of who is in control. It's a reminder of God and that we need to put him in the right place in authority and power over our lives. Just listen to these words. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know. Who created the ocean? Who caused it to be born? I said, you can come this far, but you can't come any farther. Here is where your proud waves have to stop. Have you traveled to the springs at the bottom of the ocean? Have you walked in its deepest parts? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of darkness? Do you understand how big the earth is? Tell me, 
if you know all of those things? Where does light come from? And where does darkness live? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their houses? I'm sure you know. After all, you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the places where the snow is kept? Have you seen the storerooms for the hail? Where does lightning come from? Where do the east winds that blow across the earth live? Who tells the rain where it should fall? Who makes paths for the thunderstorms? Can you tie up the beautiful Pleiades? Can you untie the ropes that hold Orion together? Can you bring out all of the stars in their seasons? Can you lead out the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper? Do you know the laws that govern the heavens? Can you rule over the earth the way I do? Can you give orders to the clouds? Can you make them pour rain down on you? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who put wisdom in people's hearts? Who gave understanding to their mind? Oh God, as we just listened to that conversation that you had with Job so long ago, it's reminding us who's in control. It's reminding us who has the ultimate power, and that is you, God. Oh God, you are so big. To think that lightning bolts report to you and you send them on their way, oh God, we don't, we don't have an ounce of power without you. And just as Jesus, your son, told Pilate, we don't have any power unless it's given to us by heaven. God, we want to say thank you this morning that you have provided salvation through what Jesus did on the cross. And I pray that if there is any here today that needs to accept you for the very very first time, they've never experienced your true saving grace and salvation that today would be the day that they would pray. And they would ask you to forgive them of their sin and that they would ask you to be Lord and Savior of their lives. Lord, help them to repent. Lord, and, and the desire to be baptized, to show that they truly want you in control of their lives. And God, for those who have accepted Christ and they're living and maybe they're just being plagued by a curse of sin on their lives. Lord, I pray that by your power that you would set them free, that they would no longer have this desire to fulfill the, the sinful nature, the wanting for sin. Lord, that they would want you, all of us, Lord, that we would desire to have you more than sin. And God, we thank you so much that you have the power to help us say no to these sins and say yes to you because we want to and not because we have to. So God, we pray that you would do a work in us today. Lord, that we would humble ourselves, recognize that you're the ultimate authority and help us to obey you. God, we thank you so much for your love and your forgiveness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're here today and that's something you want to do, you want to get right with God. You want to say today is the day of salvation. I pray that you would pray that prayer, that you would ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. And if you do that today, would you tell one of the church leaders? Would you tell them? And, and we want to help walk with you, show you what the next steps are in a relationship with Jesus. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. And that's what we want to help you with. And so as we sing this last song today, I pray that it's a song of reflection, a song of humbling and giving power over to God and not keeping that and holding on to it. 